Well, the Artemis 1 launch has been scrubbed, and now that it's Wednesday, I decided, well, I'm going to do my own in Kerbal, and while I'm at it, why not record it and turn it into a YouTube video? So here we are. Um, I'm Kyle, and as you can see on the screen at the moment, we are building our Artemis rocket, which is going to be as close as you can get really with Kerbal, but I've also got a lot of mods installed, so apologies if there's any parts there you don't recognize. They're probably from one of the many, many mod packs I have installed. For those of you who aren't too sure why the launch was scrubbed on Monday, well, here's sort of the cliff notes. Basically, they got the big, wonderful SLS rocket out onto the launch pad and hit delay after delay after delay. And some of these weren't completely in NASA's hands. For starters, they actually couldn't start fueling the rocket for two hours due to lightning near the launch site. So, you know, you don't want people to be out there when there's lightning strikes going on. So, okay. Then they had trouble with the liquid hydrogen tank because they tried to fill it and apparently this was the first time they properly filled the tank itself. Apparently it had a leak and this was solved by turning it off and on. Yes, we turned a rocket off and on to fix a problem on Monday. And then engine three on the core stage out of four was not able to be chilled to the needed temperature either. So the launch was eventually schlubbed completely because they were like, well, if we're not going to have completely even thrust, it's probably not a good idea to launch. ARS Technica have a pretty interesting article running down on all the warnings in the lead up to it and the issues they could have had. And on the screen you'll be seeing me putting together the last parts of the build for the rocket. There's quite a few different pieces in this that I've used from mod packs. And there is a bit of an issue here because 5 meter rockets is kind of the largest in Kerbal that fit the SLS look. So a 5 meter rocket it is. While we aren't exactly the same as a SLS rocket as we don't have a larger solid rocket boosters on the side and we have this wonderful grey stage adapter for the launch vehicle, it still looks pretty much bang on what we're after. And with the build finished, it's time to head to the launch platform. Well, here we are at the Kerbal Space Center. Lovely sunny day for our launch, and we're getting straight off the platform with those two big SRBs and those four engines, the RS-25s, if it was the SLS, taking us up into Earth orbit. Now, there's a lot going on with the SLS. The whole idea of it was that they said, oh, we can make this using all the leftover parts from the shuttle. So the SRBs, for instance, are recycled from the shuttle. The engines are recycled from the shuttle. The main body, the core stage, is made out of the tank for the old space shuttle. And those SRBs, unlike the uh, ones from the space shuttle, are going to be destroyed upon re-entry. And that's sort of inevitable. These new boosters are another stack taller than those used on the shuttle. They're basically like stacking four giant tin cans without the top or bottom on them with rubber rings placed between the spots where they stack. So why are we not reusing our stick of baked bean cans this time? Well, the shuttle's boosters were the largest object to ever be parachuted from high altitude, and it didn't always work, with the material already being right at the upper limit of what it could actually handle. So they decided to just drop it into the ocean. With the larger mass of these new boosters, it means they'd have an uncontrolled re-entry, meaning more damage to repair, and the cost of refurbishing them back to flight-ready status after said re-entry has been reported as costing even more than just building a new booster. So while wasteful, it is kind of understandable considering how little money NASA realistically has for Artemis from here on out. So we've just jettisoned our escape system and our clamshell covering the Orion capsule, and we're now doing our orbital burn and putting ourselves in a nice circular orbit, which isn't very much like the Orion program, I realise, as it's going to go directly into its uh, translunar insertion burn almost as soon as it gets up into orbit. But we've had our main engine cut off, and it's time to separate from the main stage so it too can crash down into the ocean, which I have kind of mixed feelings about, seeing as they're using some of the old engines from the space shuttle on it. I mean, they've flown a ton of flights. It feels a little bit almost sacrilegious to space history to just destroy them as they go burning down onto the planet. I mean, it also does kind of make a bit of sense, like, they're reusing the parts for the SLS is the reason the US Congress basically gave Artemis the go back in 2010, but it 
it feels a little bit weird to destroy 14 of these engines that were a part of space history. Well, as you can see on the screen, this is the Orion initial upper stage. It's the uh, Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, which is flying on the first few flights. And that's obviously what we've got for this time around, because that's what we're flying. However, there is going to be a bigger second stage, which is the Exploration upper stage, which is going to fly later on. And that's going to be able to deliver both a crew capsule to the moon, plus a payload such as parts of the Lunar Gateway, which is pretty cool. We're coming to the end of our fairly long, I think it was about three and a half minute lunar insertion burn, or in our case, our mana insertion burn. We're going to go for a uh, nice long orbit, and uh, you might notice a couple of little dots along our course, which will get converted into timestamps in a moment. I'll explain that later. And we just had confirmation of the destruction of the solid rocket boosters and our core stage. So F in the comments for our former space shuttle engines and SRBs. You will be missed. I mean, I guess theoretically, they haven't been launched on anything else on this. So the next part of the mission is I'm setting up a load of alarms. And that's because we've got some CubeSats to drop off. Yes, Artemis 1 is going to be carrying 10 CubeSats on its way to the moon. And it's going to send them out at different spots throughout it. And I forgot about this when I was first designing the mission. So I actually had to go back and put this little stage in the middle so that we could then go and put these out. On Artemis 1, this inner stage section will decay couple from the Orion segment about two hours into the flight and then we'll go and drop off all the CubeSats on its own but jumping backwards and forwards between crafts here is actually not great for a viewing experience so we're going to keep it connected right until we do our mine insertion burn and we'll just pretend that our interstage is as good as NASA's and has the delta v to make it all the way up into the sun and burn up so as we watch our last little probe drop out and spin itself absolutely insane we will get ready to begin our insertion burn to the mun and to do that we're going to have to disconnect from our interstage which you know we could realistically use to continue our burn here but that'd be a bit unfair so we'll just drop that off and that will go off to the sun not really i guess and then we'll do our insertion burn NASA is planning to do a what they call a distant retrograde orbit and this is going to be around the moon for Artemis 1 and that seems a little bit of an odd choice because as celestial bodies rotate you tend to want to follow that rotation in a prograde motion if you will and it's a better use of delta v you use the planet's rotation to help bring you in and it's how we end up getting our wonderful boosts when we do our planetary assists but as a shakedown from the mission for Orion it's actually not a bad idea the proposed Lunar Gateway space station is going to be in what they call a near rectilinear halo orbit. Basically, this is a really highly elliptical seven-day polar orbit, and it has its nearest approach over the lunar north pole and then goes down into deep space above the south pole. Now, this might seem like an odd choice, but it's got a lot of handy advantages. It has almost no communication blackout spots with Earth, at almost at all points in time, other than when it quickly flicks behind the moon on some occasions, it'll have direct contact with Earth. It also means that lunar missions to the south pole would be able to use the gateway as a relay station back to Earth for most of that seven day orbit as well. And it also takes a lot less delta V for station keeping due to this orbit. It's about 10 meters a second over the course of a year. And when you compare that to about 45 meters a second for satellites which are in geostationary orbit, that's pretty good. It also allows lunar landers to land almost anywhere on the surface thanks to the polar-centric orbit. According to NASA, traveling to and from cislunar space is intended to develop the knowledge and experience necessary to venture beyond the moon and into deep space. Yep, they think we should be able to get some good data from this experience to help with deep space crewed missions to Mars and Venus, which, yes, is actually being considered, but don't worry, there's no plans to put anyone on the surface. And in that time that I've been yapping about the Lunar Gateway, we've started our return to Kerbal. We spent two weeks in orbit, and just like Orion, we're going to come straight back to Earth with a fiery re-entry using a low orbit to come splashing down into the ocean. So we're going to slow ourselves down as much as possible, keep ourselves in our local entry. It's not something that Orion's going to do. They've got a bit better targeting than I do, evidently. We've jettisoned our interstage section, which will burn up beautifully next to us, I do believe. There we go. Nothing like a bit of fireworks to celebrate your return home. 
Now, I'm sure I'm not the only person who finds re-entry the most boring part of Kerbal. I mean, sure, if you've made an experimental craft or you're trying to land something big at a specific location, yeah, it can be quite a lot of focus required. You can be playing around with your air brake, you can be toggling your engine off and on, but for when you've got just like a capsule like this, which we'll have for Orion or any Apollo-style mission, it's kind of a bit dull. you just like, I just need to wait. I'm going to pop my chutes, then I'll pop my other chutes, then I'll slow down, and then I'll splash down. And that's exactly what's going to happen here, and this is exactly what's going to happen with Orion. And on that note, at this stage, the next attempt for the SLS to launch is going to be on Saturday, September the 3rd. You'll be able to watch it on NASA TV, which is basically their YouTube channel or on the NASA website. So that'll bring the video mostly to the end. If you've uh, enjoyed, like and subscribe and all that good stuff. And uh, if you reckon I should do the rest of the planned Orion missions, including the Lunar Gateway, let me know. I've been toying with the idea of doing a full playthrough of KSP as videos so that I can actually feel like I've finished it before number two comes out so if you'd be interested in that drop a comment as well thanks so much for watching and i'll catch you on the next pass